the, the Native Title Act is uh, anchored, anchored on one particularly important concept, and that is truth. The truth that this was a land of people, uh, that this was a country with a very ancient society, and that that society lived in a customary and traditional way, and in the same that same society, people had title to their land. Uh, the, the assumption was always legally in Australia that because of the notion of terra nullius, the land of no one, there could have therefore been no title, and therefore had no hereditary basis for owning land. Uh, uh, what the, Marbo, the importance of the Marbo judgment was that turned over the concept of terra nullius. It embraced the truth, uh, and in embracing the truth, uh, uh, it, it said that uh, this was the important thing that an ancient title had survived the act of sovereignty, that the act of sovereignty had not extinguished uh, what had formerly been a set of traditional titles, and that it was possible in the event that land which had not been subject to grants of interest by a land manager in the States, uh, that would still not notionally belong to the Crown, uh, or certainly not extinguished in any way by a freehold title, could be contested by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as theirs, providing they could make the, the case that they maintained a traditional way of life and had a customary association with the land. The question then was, what was the title? Uh, how would you get it? Uh, and who was entitled to have it? The great threat, of course, was the states, who wanted to extinguish the lot. And the battle I had was after the decision, uh, after the High Court decision, and once I made clear to the states that I was intending to, to legislate a basis for the, both protection and the granting of native title, that the states then more or less ganged up on me, particularly West Australia and Queensland, with the aim of extinguishing the title, which Western Australia of course tried and the High Court held to be invalid. Um, so I had a race against time. And as a consequence, from, it took 18 months from the time of the High Court decision uh, was handed down to the assent of the bills going through the House of Representatives after a year of consultation with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So uh, it, was a, it was a very a great advance, I thought, for reconciliation in Australia because we were dealing with the the original colonial grievance of dispossession. And um, we were dealing with it in a way which was superior to a parliament of Australia giving notional land rights, legislative land rights. Uh, whereas what the High Court had held, that when tested, if a group, a traditional group of people could establish their customary tradition and association with the land, they could make a claim on the land and the land could be theirs as it was always theirs rather than gifted by a parliament or notionally gifted by a parliament with land that was really never the parliament's right to give in the first place. But importantly, uh, the Act was established in consultation with the Aboriginal community and Torres Strait Islander community of Australia. It wasn't. It wasn't it wasn't a creation of the Keating Government Cabinet, but the creation of that Cabinet, uh, a subcommittee of that Cabinet, with the Aboriginal representatives 
And because, as we know, there's no Aboriginal parliament, there's no one group vested with authority. Uh, at the time, of course, uh, we had Loich O'Donoghue as the chair of ATSIC, and uh, she brought together the various land councils, and that group, uh, colloquially known as the A-Team, uh, negotiated with me the provisions. But we started with a clean piece of paper, um, and uh, it was a massive piece of property and cultural law that had to work with land management in Australia. And also to confirm titles that formally had been issued without, uh, without knowledge, but nevertheless formally had been issued, uh, in a sense illegally, uh, once it became known that a native title had survived. Uh, so, uh, uh, given the kind of racism around the country, uh, uh, and and the the propensity of premiers to sort of look after their economic interests, uh, uh, it was it was a great pressure on the federal parliamentary Labor Party, uh, and subsequently the Senate to get this passed. Um, and uh, I think that that it was um, uh, the last really important thing done in a big way for the Aboriginal community and the first and last use of the power that came with the 1967 referendum. Oh, I think when when the Aboriginal community woke up to the fact that I was not going to do what everyone else had always done to them, dud them, when they woke up to the fact that I was intending to come to a, re a legislative solution, that I would bet the government on a legislative solution. I think that was, when that, that dawning came, uh, you may know in the early stages there was a lot of uh, criticism of me and the government. Uh, by uh, uh, Aboriginal groups, uh, there's, there's no virtue in point in in dropping ten or twelve point plans, and then when not every point is adopted, you say that's because the system is rotten, and the system is biased um, and racist. What you have to do is learn to negotiate. There are some things other people want out of native title that you don't care about. You, know, you don't necessarily care about. But the things you want that they don't necessarily care about or not deeply. And so it may be possible if we negotiate a set of arrangements. Uh, I think once they, once they knew that I was not going to drop them, and that, that dawning came, notwithstanding the long grind, legal grind that followed, that was probably the best moment. It's, you, you, I mean, I think what I hope is going to be the benefit, and I still hope, is that in the end, Aboriginal people will manage land and share its value, and, and, uh, and in fact reap its value. Um, uh, now, whether that's whether that is simply a, a, a social benefit, uh, or it is uh, a material benefit, say in agriculture, or or a monetary benefit, say, in mining. Uh, these communities, uh, the, the, whole, the, the whole uplift of ownership um, and the fact that, that, that they have a right to negotiate uh, about grants of interest over their land and can, and can benefit from the proceeds of that, I've always hoped would lift Aboriginal communities up, particularly kids who do get an education then, who might end up in a university, who might, might end up in a business, and gradually as a community people tend to rise when they are empowered and, and more than that when they have some funding. So 
this may take a long period of time, the granting of, of tribunal decisions uh, has been slow and expensive, partly because of this, uh, of, of the sort of federal court and the high court's insistence on uh, proof of continuity. Uh, you may be familiar with the the the, um, the, the Yorta Yorta case in Victoria, uh, where where the trial judge uh, was insisting upon. Um, uh, evidentiary continuities for a society that never had any written history uh, and where where oral histories were discounted um, uh, and uh, as a consequence uh, I believe that the onus of proof uh, should be reversed in these cases and where it can be reasonably established an Aboriginal group have a long association with a particular region or landscape, that it should be for for other people to determine that this is not the case, you know, rather than the other way around. This would speed up the cases and see even more territory return to to that to its rightful place with their trip with the traditional owners. Uh, but already a substantial part of the continent, 32% of the continent, belongs to the tr to traditional owners and simply, simply by case law, notwithstanding the recalcitrance of the High Court, uh, of subsequent courts of the High Court, uh, we'll probably see that grow.